Yeah, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to our panel called uh, Ennials Coast to Coast. Um, and I want to first thank um, Hunter and Cultural Council for hosting us here at NADA for this programming today. We'll be talking about ennials, which are biennial or triennial exhibitions. These are exhibitions that focus on contemporary visual art and culture. They're exhibitions that usually take place outside of institutions, across a neighborhood, a city, or a region. Um, these are exhibitions whose primary focus is non-commercial um, and whose focus is public benefit. And these are also exhibitions that really try to focus on, at their best, community-engaged research and site-specific contexts. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Front's Managing Director, Front, uh, the Front Triennial in Cleveland. I also founded and chair the Annuals Alliance, which is a network of biennial and triennial leaders um, from across the continent. So it's really great to see you all here. And we have some incredible panelists with us today. <clears throat> Beside me is Nick Stillman, Executive Director of Prospect in New Orleans. We then have Derek Franklin, Artistic Director of Converge 45 Portland. Then we have Dia Vidge, who is part of the curatorial ensemble at Counter Public's 2023 edition in St. Louis, and also the curator of Creative Time. And finally, we have Kevin Moore, artistic director and curator of Photo Focus in Cincinnati. <clears throat> so we're going to be talking today about the annual model or the biennial format and what makes it unique and what seems to make it thriving. Um, or rather proliferating across the country. But first, I see a lot of um, Ennials friends um, in the audience today. Um, so I just wanted to start with a quick question. Who has who has biennials or triennials? Who has an ennial in their own city? Okay, so about half the crowd. And, um, and my second question is, um, with the panelists here with us today, and we've got representation from Cleveland, Cincinnati, um, Portland, St. Louis, New Orleans. Is there anything you notice about the cities where ennials are typically located? Does anyone want to comment? Mississippi River. <laughs> 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 Smaller, Smaller cities, yeah. Anyone else? Stereotypically, art Exactly. So outside of the typical art market. Any other thoughts? So that's a that's a recurring theme that I think will come up in our conversation today. Meaning, what are these exhibitions trying to do in these types of cities? That is, you know, not Miami, um, not New York, not LA. Um, so why are these exhibition models popping up in all these cities? What is their purpose? Um, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges is what we'll be addressing today. If we have time um, after our initial questions, we'd love to turn it over to the audience for some questions. Um, so the biennial model itself uh, you know, began in the 19th century. It grew out of the World Fair model. Um, but the contemporary biennial model um, was really born in Europe after the Second World War. And the goal was urban regeneration, the regeneration of cities, and investing in cities and place, um, and building cross-cultural connections. Um, Documenta was founded in 1955 in Kassel, in East Germany, on the edge of the West, and was an attempt also to bridge divides. And so I think, you know, placing that as, a, as you know, a paradigm and a starting model, I really want to talk about um, the role and function, or at least goals, of our contemporary biome. So Nick, I wanted to start with you and hope you could tell us a little bit about Prospect um, and how it was founded. Sure. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you, Hunter, and, um, and hello to everybody here. Uh, Prospect was founded in 2007, which I believe makes it the oldest uh, of the North American buyer triennials that is sort of of our model, which is place-based and across our city. Um, as Sarah alluded to, Prospect was very much a post-disaster effort. It was, uh, it was created in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, um, really as an effort to get people to come to a city that um, didn't have a lot of people in it at that point, have lost the infrastructure, and have lost a lot of money. Uh, I mean, Pros um, New Orleans' primary source of sort of 
large-scale revenue that fuels the city is tourism. And after something like Katrina, people weren't coming to the city anymore. And so um, it was an effort at that point in, in 2007 and into 2008 to uh, leverage um, the creative community to, to get people to come to New Orleans and remember New Orleans. Remember that New Orleans is still here and, and still fighting. So those are the seeds of um, the seeds of our training. And in what ways would you say it's grown or evolved um, in terms of mission and purpose since then? I think New Orleans needed Prospect to be that. It needed Prospect to be a magnet to, to help bring people to the city, uh, to, to get heads and beds is the big, the big phrase in, uh, in, in New Orleans. I don't know that that's what, New, I don't think that's what New Orleans needs from Prospect now. I think now um, that New Orleans has uh, kind of reestablished itself and found its footing again, New Orleans needs Prospect to be something quite different. And so that was sort of the, when, when I started as the executive director of Prospect in 2018, that was the context I found myself in, just thinking through, I, I think this organization is still behaving as if the mandate was, was the original one. And I don't sense that the, the mandate is any longer that. I think it, it needs for a prospect to be um, to be inclusive, to be community oriented, to be welcoming, to be transparent, and to be something that is in deep connection with the place that we are uh, uh, benefiting from. Um, and and I, so I think there was a there has been a shift in our model to be something that is um, about more looking at the outside world and, and focusing on the outside world and how we can bring the outside world in, I think our focus has become more uh, internal. It's become more about New Orleans. It's about lifting up New Orleans and connecting New Orleans to the rest of the world rather than the rest of the world to New Orleans. Great. Um, Derek, your um, experience with the your biennial converge is slightly newer. Um, and you were talking about, you know, um, the impact of the exhibition on downtown Portland post-COVID. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think we're kind of in a situation with where Prospect was in the beginning, um, thinking about, one, how do we rebuild our downtown? I think um, we're still in the heads and beds phase, but also thinking about how we can do that by including the community, spreading our exhibitions into different neighborhoods, and um, working with the infrastructure that we have. I think also since we're even further away from major art centers, it's important to think about how our local community can create a conduit with other communities and uh, engage in discourses in ways that kind of bring in and export in certain ways. And I think for our city, we had both the impact of COVID, the wildfires the year before COVID, and then um, social justice, protest, media coverage that like painted the city in a certain way. And so we've had a lot of hard time getting people to come back to our city, which is pretty known for like natural tourism and food tourism. Um, and that's even been a struggle in our city. So. Um, the arts is somewhere in which we can kind of build. And I think a lot of our nonprofits and organizations have struggled during that time. And after COVID, it was like, what can we do to kind of work together? How do we change the format of what we're doing here that's less competitive and more collaborative and figure out a way in which we can work together that helps everybody at the same time? And what have you seen in terms of results? Um, I think the results was a massive turnout by the city in this last one. Converge was started in 2016, but it's been a much smaller program for many years, and this was kind of our first um, full-scale um, proof of concept year. And we're just really excited to think about now that we like struggled through the ways in which you develop how to do that thing, um, how we can do it better now that we've done it at that scale. Um, also, people came to the city 
and we're like, Portland's amazing, it's fun, the food's great, it's beautiful, it's a walkable city. Um, I heard all these things. And so that's also changing, so we're excited. So we're seeing a lot of investment in place, a focus on cities and urban renewal. Um, Dia, when we spoke, you know, um, thinking about longer term impact in a neighborhood or a place was very important to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So my experience with triennials is, is different. I, I was on the curatorial ensemble for Counter Public in this 2023 edition in St. Louis, so I don't work for Counter Public. I'm based in New York. I work full time as a curator of creative time. Um, and so part of when I, James McCannelly, who's the executive director, artistic director of Counter Public, invited me to join curatorial ensemble, I was like going to say no because I'm not from St. Louis. I have a lot of ethical questions around what that means to come into a place I don't have a relationship to. And really the only reason why I agreed to do it, and I think most of my co-curators would say the same thing, is that the um, organization went through a really rigorous community engagement process for the first year of its planning. That looked like town halls, it looked like one-on-one -on -one meetings, it looked like uh, studio visits with local artists, and it was run by um, uh, Shiraz Gorman, who's also a community health worker in St. Louis. And the impetus for the triennial in this iteration is the second one. The first one was also pretty hyper-local, and the second one was at Citywide. It covered seven miles of St. Louis, um, up and down Jefferson Avenue, which cut the city north to south, and a city that's kind of built east to west. So already that kind of mapping moved through a racial line and a major racial divide that is pretty historic in St. Louis and tried to touch upon a lot of those issues. But the um, real impetus was like, how does this triennial be supportive of community-led efforts that are already happening? And that was kind of what brought us all as curators in conversations together. What can we do here that is resourcing all already existing efforts. And what we learned from all that community engagement is we were thinking about um, futures. How do we define or allow space for imagining futures? And what we learned from all of this community engagement is that people were actually more interested in naming histories that have been lost. And they're like, whose futures? To what end? Who are you really talking about? And so we kind of went in thinking about that. Like, how, how are we working with artists to excavate these lost histories and St. Louis has a really intense history of urban renewal projects that were incredibly racist that led to a lot of further segregation and dispossession of land. So our manifest destiny launched from its origins are kind of a launching pad for indigenous genocide and land theft. And all of that is on the ground that, that we stand on, right, in St. Louis. And so uh, initially, so immediately, um, Counter Public with some of the curators got in touch with the Osage Nation. It used to be Mound City. There's one remaining mound there. A huge part of the triennial was trying to work with artists, especially New Red Order, to rematriate that last remaining mound to, to the Osage Nation. Um, I worked with artist Jordan Weber, who had been working in St. Louis for a few years with abolitionist groups like Clothes um, and Workhouse and Art City Defenders that have been doing a lot of work around abolition of prison and jails. And um, his work is really about connecting the violence of the land to the violence of the body. And we knew that we wanted to use the momentum of the triennial to get to make a permanent rainwater capture garden and address the ecological issues in the neighborhood. Um, so we were thinking about like, what are these traces that we leave behind that help amplify these community efforts? That's also a community land trust. So there was a lot of conversation around ownership and kind of property ownership. about impact, we were really thinking about land, and we were really thinking about redistribution of resources, and how art could be in service of that. Um, and so I think all of those kinds of goals are really long-term, too. So the amazing thing in the short term is that the visitorship was really big, um, and every project you visited was so site-specific and historically rooted that you got a really deep history of St. Louis that you might not have known before, even if you grew up there. Um, and in every article that came out, you had to learn about the Osage Nation in this mound. You had to learn about Mill Creek Valley, a bustling black neighborhood that was raised 
to make way for all the stadiums and government buildings popping up. But you, you had to contend with that even in the conversation around the triennial. And I think all of the other impact is yet to be seen. That's really long term. And you talk about, you know, talking about long-term traces um, in a biennial or triennial and an annual format is, you know, thinking quite radically because, um, you know, a biennial and triennial is often based on an ephemerality of experience. Um, so, you know, we're episodic, we recur, we often change artistic leadership or curatorial direction. Um, with each edition, many of us don't have buildings or institutions that we operate from. And so when I founded the Ennials Alliance, um, along with you know dear colleagues during COVID, a lot of it was really a response to COVID and thinking, how do we even kind of survive in this moment? But it was also trying to think bigger and think about the fact that, you know, as these ephemeral organizations, we've often been able to evade a level of introspection um, and institutional critique that other institutions have at least you know started the process. Um, so when you do think about long-term traces, and I know um, you say that has yet to be seen, um, is are there is there anything you might kind of reference that you feel was a success um, that you accomplished or that the you know the counter public had accomplished during that period? Yeah, I mean I think there currently that rainwater capture garden is being built. We broke ground the last yeah. week of. Yeah, the last week of the triennials when that broke ground. Um, and I think the, the real success, but the, the, I mean, there's so many amazing outcomes to that triennial. And there's so many community partners, dozens and dozens of community partners. There's a really robust school program alongside it. Um, but I think what really made it feel different for me as a curator coming into one iteration and leaving after is the infrastructure that the organization is building that held the community engagement as we were getting our bearings into working on this triennial and that also it made a long-term commitment to see through the rematriation of that mound and to continue these community partnerships into the next iteration and the next one which is not something that's possible when you're just on the curatorial team for one of the many of its of its iteration so it makes it possible for us curators to work responsibly actually and i think that's like the biggest structural success i could think from counter public is that we were able to come into community partnerships that were already um had trust amongst them and, and help grow them and build them um, but that work is really held held in the staff and the leadership of counter public so you mentioned trust, um, and I'm going to shift over to Kevin now. You're also, you know, an artistic director, curatorial role, based in New York, coming into a place like Cincinnati. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that looks like, what the dynamic also between um, local or regional artists and kind of national and international artists looks like? That's, you know, that's also, I feel, one of the both opportunities and challenges of an ennial is the platform it gives for dialogue between um, the local and the, and the national and international? Uh, yes. Uh, Photo Focus started in Asia Photography Biennial, U.S.'s largest photography biennial, we learned you know, not too long ago. Um, it started in 2012. Uh, I came on board in 2013, and I'm, 2014 was the first year we called it a biennial. And we structured it in the fall of October every other year, even years, and then we have like a spring lecture and some other things we do programming-wise. But um, I had been familiar with Cincinnati. I did an exhibition at the Art Museum in 2010, covered photography in the 70s, big exhibition of book, and so I was kind of familiar with this. I grew up in Kansas City and Missouri. Um, so uh, coming from New York when I was called in, I think the idea then, a lot of threads of interest here with different people Cincinnati was not sort of re rebounding from some sort of bad image or anything. Really, Cincinnati's one kind of self-conscious um, historical moment was the Mapplethorpe scandal in 1990. And I think there's still a lot of self-consciousness about Cincinnati being a prudish place. Even there's a very, very long history of art school. Uh, it's, it, with ties to Europe, Cincinnati's a bold city like Philadelphia or Boston. So I think at first the idea was that I would import things from the best of what's happening in the photography world. And then we would sort of activate different spaces around town. In the first year, 2014, 
we were in obvious places like the Contemporary Art Center, which is the Zaha Hadid building, and uh, we've been in the Taft Museum and the National Underground Freedom Railroad Freedom Center um, over the years. But but I think we very self-consciously though moved into a neighborhood that was finally uh, after years of being kind of a slum like a sort of racial divide in Cincinnati, like many places, this area of town over the Rhine uh, had been sort of the poor neighborhood of the city and developers were moving in. This is um, good and bad, you know, a lot of different kinds of things, outcomes occur and that sort of thing. We very consciously, that first year in 2014, um, got pop-up spaces. We essentially pushed our economics into the community by, by cubing spaces, uh, making them available for artists for this temporary exhibition and then we turned them over to developers or, or purchasers after that and, and we also uh, had our talks in Memorial Hall which is uh, a 1950s beautiful theater in Cincinnati in that neighborhood next to the music hall so park music hall Memorial Hall this neighborhood was developing that's how they like I think your next question will be so sort of how has that changed since then <laughs> um, since then uh, we've We've expanded, we have like a hundred participating venues that occur in town. I curate one or two shows myself. I bring in guest curators from the major institutions. Um, I think that we think now more about balancing local and, and work from outside. And I think of the sort of model as a architecturally, like, like I'm the tower, I'm the radio tower, and it's sending signal in from other places, but then we sort of fan out on the ground and include many different participating venues. We encourage all kinds of people to participate. There's a theme, each year it changes. Um, so we try to bring people together. And I think, I think there's a kind of diplomatic mission in the sense that we're sort of creating a coalition within the city, but also um, with sort of points of contact outside. And so um, digging a little bit deeper into the relationship between the local, um, the regional, and the international, at its best, what do you think it can do? Um, and can you respond or, or anyone else here? I'll just throw in quickly that we, we partnered with Creative Time for our, our symposium this last fall, and, uh, and it was one of the more balanced. Usually we try to think in terms of percentages of, it, in terms of symposiums, in particular, um, like how many people you're importing from out of town, how many people you're engaging in town. And I often am looking for people in Cincinnati, but I would say that this, this experience with Creative Time, pushed by Creative Time, I think in a lot of ways, was a very balanced um, symposium. I would say it was almost 50-50 in terms of like who was local and who came from some other place. And there were incredible, beautiful connections from people they already knew each other. We as the coordinators of that, um, myself and Justine Ludwig, didn't often know um, the sort of web of, of contacts between the different participants until they all showed up and we realized there, were, there was already an established sort of global community in a sense. But, but Cincinnati was very much um, not just the sort of percentage inclusion that sometimes happens in like art institutions where they want to reach on. This, this was a true partnership, I would say, with, with a, a great balanced effort in that sense. And it was very successful. I, I thought it was very satisfying for everyone involved. Because I know certainly um, when we talk about the international in a place like Cleveland, when we talk about Front and bringing in international artists, and I actually moderated a panel recently by the Cleveland Council on World Affairs, and questions from the audience were, what about the local? Right? What are we doing about the local? How are we investing? Um, and what I would like to do, right, ideally, is push away from a binary model where it's local versus national or international and really think about what a more open ended platform or dialogue could look like. And I wonder if anyone else has had, you know, positive experiences or negative to share in that regard. I think um, with Converge, we've had some pretty positive responses about also the level in which we have included local. Um, so one thing that we try to do is really um, underwrite and fund like major large projects by local artists that were at the scale of large projects we were bringing in by national and international artists. 
And then another thing we tried to do is like we really did not do any of the like VIP or exclusive kind of stuff when we did the thing and it was kind of all public open, wide open programming, which also like brought together local artists wherever they're at, neighborhood they're at, or level of career together with press from outside, um, curators from outside of the region, artists from outside of the region, and we um, really wanted them to all kind of be together and have community while like the opening weekend was going on so that they could, you know, form relationships with each other in a way that felt meaningful. Yeah, I saw you, Manny. Oh, um, I mean, it's the, my, it's such an important question and, and I've worked in public art in many different capacities and for the Department of Cultural Affairs for the city of New York and that kind of pitting against local and not local is like such a major sticking point for any public art process. So, and I think there's so much potential and there's so much lost by not creating spaces for dialogue across geographies. Um, we see it every time we hit a new inflection point in political crises that we don't actually talk beyond ourselves and we have the opportunity to create those bridges and um, for counter public there was I want to say about a third of the artists were from St. Louis and part of that community engagement was um, open hours with one of the curators or St. Louis artists um, throughout the planning process and some of those artists got to um, participate as artists in the triennial and um, all, all of my projects, we were a curatorial ensemble and not um, a curatorial collaborating group, which meant that we worked side by side instead of together, kind of countering this idea of one authoritative voice. So we had different geographic areas that we were assigned, and because of the kinds of curators we are and the long term dialogue we were in, there's just naturally a lot of overlaps. Um, and so, a lot of all of my projects were in collaboration with either St. Louis activists or activist organizations, the sewage department, um, a, perform a couple um, improvisational and storytelling performers, Jackie and Papa Wright, that did a, a sound piece, worked for one year with artist Stephanie Jameson on a sound piece by Josephine Baker that played in a Ferris wheel. So they all had like these really deep kind of connections with St. Louis artists, activists, thinkers, um, as a way to, to bridge those um, Raven Chacon's performance brought in drumming um, drummers and drumming groups from across the city. Mindy and Keith Obadike brought in car groups from across the city. Um, there's always a bit similarly, there's nothing VIP or um, nothing exclusive. And, and the biggest project in Counter Public is a permanent monument by St. Louis artist Damon Davis. And when it's complete, it'll be one mile long and will mark all of the families that used to live in Mill Creek Valley before it was raised by the city um, in an urban renewal project. And, and there was a lot of emphasis on rooting in St. Louis, but creating these opportunities to kind of share practice, to share political dialogue. Um, that's kind of how we approached it in this time. I think that's also where the longest term impact will probably so we're talking, I mean, out of these conversations, it's clear that we're talking about a model that is very, very different than art fairs, that's very, very different um, from museums and larger arts institutions. <laughs> and probably because of those things, um, we see them we see them proliferating. Um, Nick, one of the things that when we spoke, one of the aspects of a, you know, an NEL that you mentioned was the really kind of like experimental model. Um, and, and working, kind of prioritizing artists in that way. Can you talk a little bit about how you work with artists at Prospect and how that probably looks very different um, than other models in the art world? Yeah, I'm happy to. And I think it's, um, I, you know, if we're, if we're speaking most optimistically about the, the work that we do, I think this is it. Like, uh, we, and I sense all of my colleagues here, are able to uh, work with artists in kind of a long form engagement so it's 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 across at least in most cases two and a half years to produce a piece that they often would not have produced otherwise so in the upcoming prospect six which by the way is november 2nd 2024 to february 2nd 2025 
uh, we think about 80, 80, 80 to 85 percent of the works in the show to be specially commissioned for prospect or newly created for prospect. And so, um, I mean, put simply, it, it, it affords artists the opportunity to create something that they may not have created otherwise in their career, and without sort of the context or pressure of um, sales, if it's a, a gallery associated with uh, uh, kind of a, a market forces or a, or a gallery, or uh, if, if it's an artist that is not associated with the gallery, which is going to be a lot of our list for Prospect 6, they get to work with uh, an infrastructural team of curators and support staff to help make it work, which is often quite different for an artist who doesn't come um, from a, a commercial background. So I, yeah, I think it's, it's the best thing that our, our models are working for. Um, so one thing that kind of goes back to the question before is, um, so we have like a little bit of a different format in our staff infrastructure. So I'm the artistic director, but I'm like from Portland and live there. And so, and then we bring in a guest artistic director. So part of that is also my job is to kind of be on the ground, work with the artists in the way that like Nick is talking about, but also like when we go out to community partners and other things, it's a, a real kind of partnership where we're sometimes we have artists sometimes that we're like bringing to them. Other times we're talking to them about like, what's something that you've been wanting to do? Is there, what can we do to do something that you wanted to do that kind of fits into our model that would be interesting to you? Can we support that curatorially? Can we on that and other times we go into these institutions and we work directly with their already existing curatorial staff so sometimes we share that kind of um, relationship with the artists and figure out way which is also pulling resources too right it's like I got this money you got this money like what can we do um, artists what are your dreams can we make this thing come true that you never thought about before and then we're kind of all working together with the guest uh, curatorial person also. So that's that's what makes something really amazing to me is the way in which like so many people can kind of come together, um, bring their thing to the party, and then figure out how to do this thing that maybe wouldn't happen otherwise, both for the, the space that might be institutional or community-based, and for the artists that we're working and trying to be the most artist forward at that time. And artists really love it. It's exciting for them to be able to work in that way and um, feel that kind of support and community around major projects. So I would say we're, you know, we're hearing that at our best, at our best, we're centered on place. We're investing in local communities. We're opening up space for dialogue and for experimentation. Um, I think those are our whys. I'm curious to hear, I know we have artists in the audience, we have public art leaders, we have other biennial leaders. Um, are there other thoughts on um, why you're doing what you're doing, or at our best, why this model is thriving or proliferating? Does anyone want to share a thought? Jenny, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> 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 Jenny is the leader of Desert X in California. Um, well, I have a question. I think a lot of these um, models and, and why artists are so interested in developing these projects are they're impossible in other organizations. Right? I often say to my museum colleagues, like, we're able to do in three months what it would take maybe four or five years to develop in terms of exhibition and project. Specifically, like a site, a specific location. So I think that's what's making us, you know, fragile in a way. Because obviously, we open ourselves to all the opportunities of accelerating production and fundraising, uh, producing work, but we also are realizing things that are more important and that are important. I don't know if um, everyone heard Jenny, but she was talking about the notion of time. 
that NELs really run on an entirely different time paradigm than larger institutions or museums, which has both, I think, opportunities um, and challenges. But our panelists, you know, want to address that? Yeah, yeah. I, I've worked in museums before. Uh -huh. I worked at the Metropolitan Museum in Harvard, and I love the speed of the biennial. Uh, our team is small. We're scrappy. We do things really fast. We basically we basically work like a commercial gallery in the sense that we just get shit out. But we also produce the quality of a museum exhibition. And um, I, we're trying very hard to address the contemporary moment. And in Cincinnati, we don't, we don't commission as much, I don't think, as you all do. We, we actually look for curated projects, and we try to kind of uh, bring things in that are kind of talking about the contemporary moment under a particular theme. But, um, but it is a, a great opportunity for people who wouldn't have a space to show that work or to start that discussion in other areas. I feel like Santa Claus telling people that we're interested in doing something with you. Sometimes it's a question of finding the right space for them. Um, you know, it's like, it's a great project. This is too small a space for you. Perhaps we can find a larger one. But we have a, a big chessboard and we can shuffle things around very quickly and, and things happen very fast. And I think in that sense that with the way, with the speed of the contemporary news cycle now, I mean, obviously we're not trying to address sort of every issue as it happens, but it's 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 kind of insane. We we always happen right before a presidential election, for example, and we don't know like what the outcome of that would be and what that would produce, and so we try very hard. I, I had to scrap projects we stuff. You had <laughs> oh yeah. So um, we. We encourage sort of engagement with politics. It's in Cincinnati, we're, we're not sort of featuring photography per se. We're, we're sort of examining the world through the lens of photography and film. That's the way we approach that. And uh, photography is arguably one of the best you know, modes of, of trying to sort of do that. Also philosophically, it has a kind of like a, what's your version of reality kind of component to it. So we get a lot of different projects, but it's, it's just by its nature engaged with what's happening in the world, and we want it to be speaking to the, to the current moment. I think part of what we're all saying is that there's, and this is an opportunity and a challenge, there's no normal in our model. And <laughs> and so that can become a grind, uh, but it's also kind of exhilarating. And I'm looking at two guys back here from New Orleans, Serge Longcar and Dan Alley, who in Prospect 5 helped build a very large Nary Ward sculpture that was also a roving sound piece that was situated in multiple locations across the city. Like that's a deeply abnormal artwork uh, that um, there's there's not really any model for. And and I find I, I think my colleagues here do also that um, that's just the normal thing for us is that we're producing something that we've never produced before. And so experimentation is sort of built into the model, which means you're constantly reinventing the wheel the worst way to do business. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's very exciting also. Yeah, that's like the the name of the game at Creative Time. Every time we close a project, we're like, these are all the lessons learned that we'll never be able to apply to anything else. <laughs> the site will be different, and the next artist will use material we never even thought would be art. Um, but it is the most exciting, and that kind of flexibility and adaptability and the way that we get to be so rooted in time, I think is exactly when public art is its best. I do think kind of the glaring challenge or code we haven't yet cracked is that we don't resource artists appropriately to do that kind of work. It is so research heavy. It takes so much time. It takes teams on their end. It takes travel. And we just have not, as an industry, figured out how to properly support materially artists as they embark on these longer term engagements. And that is a challenge. That's a challenge. And it feels bad, I will say as a curator, to work with artists knowing that I am demanding so much of their time and cannot provide a reasonable salary for them to support their lives. I couldn't agree with that more. And sometimes it makes me think we should just be working with fewer artists. Yeah. As unfortunate as that is, but Working with fewer artists means you can allocate more time, resources, and attention and intentionality toward the artist. And that's that's the model we're moving to at Front. Um, we want to we want to showcase less artists and you know invest much more deeply. Do do we all pay the artists? Do you give them like an honorarium or something? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So I'll, I'll kind of weigh in here. Um, so I was able to secure wage certification for Front. Um, we were the first arts institution in Cleveland um, to secure certification and the first non-institutional biennial triennial. I know wage is a step and just a step in the right direction. Um, but essentially, for those of you who don't know what it is, it really mandates based on your budget, um, transparent <clears throat> and equitable artist fees to, you know, based on project. Does anyone else you know, have thoughts? And like I said, one of the reasons I felt um, I compelled to really gather colleagues um, to really think collaboratively about the model was really to be introspective about challenges. Because I feel like, you know, <clears throat> like we discussed, the ephemerality of the model allows us to evade a lot of um, <clears throat> allows us to evade a lot of introspection. And a lot of the site specificity of the model, you know, doesn't necessarily allow us to apply lessons learned moving forward. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> what would you say um, is your biggest challenge um, in your models? Well, I would say in the same way that there's those types of challenges with the speed and other things, the great thing about our models is they're so fluid that you can also make changes very quickly after you learn lessons that are issues. And that was something that was exciting for me working on a tri triennial like this that citywide is. Um, I came from academia before that and like everything's so slow and things are unethical and you try to make changes but you're like it's just going to be a decade before we can ever get there. But with like organizations that are fluid like this and working with so many partners, you can actually make changes fairly quickly. Um, so that's a pretty exciting for me to be part of an organization that can actually change the way they're doing things in literally a matter of months. Nick, do you have thoughts on your biggest challenge? Yeah, I um, I don't know what the biggest challenge is. I think, um, I guess to distill it, it's like, I feel a responsibility to keep Prospect current and contemporaneous with a city that is changing, that is itself changing very quickly. And so this is why I feel very um, kind of obstinately stuck on this idea that, that Prospect was created for a reality that is no longer our reality. And so I think constantly re-examining what the reality of your community is and then attempting as best you can to to reflect that or incorporate that into the work is like that's very introspective and very hard work and thinking to do and um and and we were sort of having this conversation a moment ago in the rhythm of a bi or triennial it, it's very rhythmic and so in in those beginning stages year one in particular is full of possibility, it's full of uh, the, the the opportunity to change. Once you get deeper into the cycle, you're in execution mode. And then uh, for, for in our case, a kind of full year and a half or more, you don't really have that opportunity for introspection and change. And so um, that I would say is, uh, it, that was sloppily articulated, but I think that's the biggest challenge is, is staying current within a time frame that even though three years feels like a long time, it's pretty compressed for the, the work. Uh, yeah, I, picking up on that point, I think, you know, we're 10 years old now, uh, Photo Focus in Cincinnati, and the thing that I worry about the most is that we're sort of institutionalizing or calcifying that, you know, for example, we're building our own building now. Finally, after all of these years, it's a two-story, you know, beautiful gallery building, 4,000 square feet gallery space. Um, so we will have a year-round program in that building. We, we're becoming the institution, but we will still have the biennial. So, but the thing that, that, that frightens me is just the mindset of like having to kind of, you know, stock all of that, all of those spaces of art all the time, but you're not really getting a chance to be that kind of scrappy, think on your feet, like dream big, that kind of, that kind of um, that kind of uh, art person, and uh, that that to me was what always excited me the most about it. And now that it, we're sort of wading into more kind of institutional procedures and responsibilities and budgets and all these kind of kinds of things, you know, it starts to really weigh on your sense of being able to speak to the contemporary moment and really be.
be in the community. And the building is in that neighborhood that I mentioned earlier, you know, it's embedded, but I, I'm afraid it's going to be another, it's like a spaceship. It's going to, it's going to be another sort of high, it's a more unapproachable institution for so many people, and even though we intend it to be very open and welcoming. So we'll see how that goes, but that for me is kind of the current sense of, of the biggest challenge right now. Well, I'll, I should probably say here that we have very good funding in Cincinnati. We just have one one patron, basically, and uh, we do seek outside funding through foundations and Terra and Warhol and things like that for special projects, but we're very lucky that we don't we don't have um, to fundraise probably as much as a lot of you do. So um, so in some ways, you know, I think that that's a danger to us because I think in some ways that we might we run the risk of becoming lazy with that. I think and the building will be open year round. We'll have a presence in the community. We can do things. We have our spring lecture. We like to do film series and things like that. But um, and I, I'm going to be more sort of sitting on that heap once the building is constructed and then the biennial will be kind of sort of other people taking over I think which is the only way I can see that happening but um, but, but yeah I think that, that we're lucky to have funding I'm sure that funding is a big time suck for a lot of people yeah and Stacy that was a great question um, if you if anyone ever comes to our annual alliance meetings that's probably our number one topic is funding models and sustainability you know, everything that we do at Friend, and I'm sure, I think most of the other biennials and triennials here today is free and open to the public. Um, our base is philanthropic support. What that means um, in terms of who we're getting funding from, the cycle of our funding vastly affects um, the exhibition model. And I would love him, Hunter, next time we do a conversation, um, if we could talk about funding models. Um, but yeah, great question. Do you have another question? Yeah, um, so I'm in Cincinnati also, and I was going to speak to, I think when you think about ideals, we might be ideally situated because there's real generosity behind our biennial at its core, and so that actually fosters, I think, really broad-based community engagement, local artist engagement, really um, every, you know, neighborhood-based organization, startup, gallery, even individual artists can apply and conceive of a way to participate in that probably contributed to the scale. And I was just yeah. kind of curious, when you think about challenges, though, when you think about scale, um, yeah. are there any inherent challenges? That, well, that, that was something I was going to address, too. In some ways, you become a victim of your own success, because maybe the first year we had 50 participating venues, now we have 100. Do you keep adding more? Or do, I, I like what Nick said earlier, I feel like in some ways you pull back and do less better, but just from a marketing point of view, that doesn't necessarily look good. There's this assumption that it always has to be bigger and better. Um, so I, I think that, and also too, that we give out all of this money to support all of these, these participating venues. They all get something, and we turn down very few. Like There are very few projects that actually don't measure up. We try to fund every single thing, and in some ways we, we discuss whether we should be a little more critical or selective, but we like to be very democratic because I think that more comes out of the unexpected places when we do that. They are working with a theme, but we're very loose about the theme, and we like to encourage very unexpected projects. Any other questions or thoughts from the audience? We've shared, again, why we're doing what we're doing. We're sitting in the middle of an art fair. Um, why do you go to a biennial? Triennial when you visit one. Anyone want to share a thought? For me, it's, it's for me, it's kind of to be in the place. But uh, the flip side of that, I was with I was in Carolyn's documenta a few years back, and I was on my map, and I was looking at all the sites around the castle, and I flipped the map over, and the other sites are in Cobham, and I was like, I'm not going to get there. But that was a really exciting curatorial gambit that did it again in Athens, but that. That got tricky. Um, I know Front exists in Cleveland and also surrounding cities. I know that there's been a lot of talk of Desert X, of course. How do you all approach off-site models, out-of-town out models, or coalition building? I mean, I'll just say, you know, for Front, it's really, 
like I always say, front is a collaborative platform. It's much less single institution than purely collaborative. Um, and so when you really kind of try to think more broadly about what arts and culture could mean for a place, um, and you start thinking about the arbitrariness of geographical boundaries, right? You stop thinking about a city, and you can start more thinking about either smaller scale region or a smaller scale neighborhood, or even larger scale region. Um, and it's really exciting to start thinking in those very different ways um, about place. I don't know if others have thoughts to share on that. I think we're all trying to do both the local and the global at the same time. It's a little bit what we're doing with food and politics and sort of every other thing that seems like an ideal. And uh, I don't know sometimes if that parallel is actually working. I, I think the way I think of the world is through right now I'm kind of forming the biennial. But how, how do you, you know, for example, how do you think about, you guys are very much embedded in a very specific level of history and all of that, right? But what, maybe it's kind of back to where we started, like how does this sort of like larger discourse of global issues impact that? Well, for, for creative time, I will say that New York is a global city. So again, I used to work at the Queens Museum, which is like Queens is the most diverse district in the country, the most diverse country in the world. And so by being hyper-local, we were being international. So that discourse is always there, no matter where you are in New York City, that exchange is always present. Um, and it cuts across class and social boundaries. And um, in St. Louis and Counterpublic, I'm not sure that the model is growing to expand geographically beyond the city, but I would say to your question, Hunter, it's also like, well, who's the central audience? And I was at the Charge of Biennial last year, and it had expanded very much to other cities, and we were being bussed around to cities that were being developed through developing an art infrastructure there. And people were, the goal, I think, is that people move there and build these cities through the arts, and that's their goal for why expanding geographically, but I would say another one would be who's already there? How are they engaging with the arts? What's the utility of art in that sense? And, and how are we thinking first that way and second about those that will be traveling a map and a place they don't know? Yeah. And I'll add there, you know, Front is based in Cleveland, but also Akron and Oberlin. Um, and I realized I should have my question to Rick Rogers, who's the executive director of Curated Storefront. In Akron, um, Curated Storefront is a front partner. How do you feel? Um, you know, the, the front collaboration in Akron has been. Well, I think it's been superb, and we've uh, generated uh, a lot of synergistic. Uh, a lot of uh, there's been a lot of synergy between the two groups, and we've been able to perform way beyond our own capacity by collaboration. And it's helped with uh, fundraising and all of the work across the board. It's been good for both organizations. That's just in the tent. I think um, for Converge, you know, Portland, it's pretty far to the next place that we we'll possibly have um, somewhere that we could partner with, like hour and a half to two hours. And it seems like as an organization, it would be very hard for us to get viewership to go there. And also like we don't, I think we're really thinking a lot about like not um, fatiguing viewership in a certain way and um, just trying to kind of keep our community that we have as part of the thing. And it seems like it'd be really hard for us as an organization to expand outside of the city, because maybe we're not even doing the best job at our own city yet, but trying to figure that out. Well, I think we're, um, we're at the end of our hour here, so I wanted to thank, um, first of all, our incredible panelists for joining us. <laughs> Hunter and Cultural Council for hosting us here at Canada. And thanks to each of you for joining us um, in the heat with about 100 other things to do today. Um, if you have any questions, we'll all be here for a few minutes after. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Yeah.